Hey everybody, uh, it's first thing Saturday morning and we are going to do an around the world update and that way I can get started with my day and get started on half the stuff we're going to be talking about in this update. Uh, I got a lot to cover today so we're not really going to spend any time on tanks that don't need it such as this one. I haven't done anything to this tank. Um, but I will let us look at this tank for a moment while I explain that for those of you who follow along with all my videos, you're probably going to hear a lot of stuff you already know about, but I do have a lot of viewers that sort of rely on these round the world updates to kind of keep up on what's going on in a generalized kind of way. So if I hash over uh, topics I've discussed at length over the last week or so, please forgive me, um, but I do need to cover pretty much everything that's going on for my viewers that kind of rely on these videos as their update source. So moving right along to the Garami tank. Uh, the only thing I've got going on is I've added new fish in here. I'm um, assuming by now everybody is aware of the sick fish that I have in there, my snakeskin Garami. You can see her in that back far right corner. Uh, she spends a lot of time down there. She spends a lot of her time facing nose down. Um, but she does swim around. I do see her up and in the tank occasionally. She is near the surface. She's still feeding. So as far as I can tell, nothing has really uh, changed or shifted about her position. I did finally remove the 18 neons that I had in my quarantine tank. And I know we're not getting a very good look at them at the moment. I did just turn the lights on. And if you're familiar with neons, you know they all hide and sleep down at the bottom. And their colors wash out and everything else. So we're not exactly getting you know, a beautiful look at a huge school of neon swimming around in this tank, but trust me, it's really uh, pleasing to the eye when you see that group of neons just moving around through this tank. It really adds a nice, needed touch of color in this tank. Uh, I know that sounds silly, this looks like a bright and colorful tank, but it's really not. Um, so those neons are going to add a little bit of sparkle and flash to this tank. I've wanted to put neons in here for a long time. Uh, in fact, I used to put neons in here all the time. When they were on sale for a dollar, I would buy 12 or 15 and throw them in here. And they'd last about a month before the last one finally got eaten by that bumblebee jelly catfish that I had in here. Since he is no longer in here, I'm assuming that the neons will be safe. I do have a South American bumblebee, but he's really small and not very aggressive, so I'm not too worried about it. Maybe one or two of the smallest of the neons might disappear. Uh, but for the most part, we're just going to have a nice little school of neons swimming around in that tank. Uh, what I've got coming up in this tank is it's time for a massive water change. I've got, um, when, when I say massive water change, I don't necessarily mean the volume of water. I mean it's just going to be a labor-intensive water change. i got to get in there and trim out a lot of those plants. i got to cut back the tiger lotus. i got to thin out the uh, floating water sprite. And we are going to be getting in there and doing another filter cleaning and filter change. Uh, so I'll try to do another point of view um, head cam video of that of me cleaning out the canister filter. I'm also still sucking a lot of water off the surface through the surface skimmer so that indicates that even though I've opened up the um, the screen or the cage around the intake of the filter I think it's still got some stuff up inside the intake tube on the filter and it's causing me to suck more water off the surface and therefore is drawing air down into it through the surface skimmer tube. Um, so I'm probably going to have to wind up getting in there and pulling that filter apparatus out and giving it a good thorough cleaning as well. You do have to do that from time to time. It's kind of a pain in the butt, but you only have to do it about once a year probably. I guess it depends on your tank. Um, I haven't done it in quite a long time, and this will be the first time I've really gotten in there and done a full cleaning to the intakes as well as the filter itself. So look forward to that. That'll be a big video. Uh, I'm going to try to get that done this weekend, uh, but we'll see how that goes. My angelfish tank has nothing new really going on it that I can speak of. Um, I am still kind of in the mental process of revamping this tank, but I haven't physically done anything to it uh, since the last time we reported on it. Um, the next time I get in here and do a water change, I'll do what I did before. I'll use that siphon, I'll suck out some more of that white sand, and we'll just keep slowly working the process of getting all that white sand out of there, and eventually I'm going to replace it with the black sand. Uh, otherwise, no changes, no new inhabitants, nobody's died, you know, nothing else is really going on in this tank. My black ghost knife fish, I'm going to sit down in front of this one for a moment. Hopefully we'll actually get to see him come out. Uh, this is formerly my T-bar tank, formerly my African tank, currently my black ghost knife fish tank. 
I finally got that T-bar out of here. I did some video on that. That was actually a little easier than I expected it to be. I thought it was going to be quite a challenge getting the T-bar out of there. And while it wasn't easy, it wasn't as impossible as I thought. I thought I was really going to have to tear this tank down and remove some of the wood and maybe even some of the rock work uh, to finally get him out of there. But I did convince him to go into the net eventually, and I got him in another tank, which we'll be seeing in a few minutes. So this tank has now become my... Uh, Black Ghost Knife Fish Tank, and I'm really, really happy with it so far. I know it looks kind of boring and bland right now, but the Black Ghost Knife Fish does come out uh, much more frequently now. When I put food in the tank, um, you know, when I do my morning and evening feedings, he comes out, he swims around. Look, you can see his little face sticking out of his cave there in the bottom right now. Um, so if there was food in there, he'd be out swimming around. I guess maybe I should have done my morning feeding before I started doing this video, but I really did want to just shoot this and, and uh, get my day started. So not a lot going on as far as change for this tank from here on out. We finally got this tank settled in. I do have one change I'm going to be making to it, an addition I should say, uh, but we will get to that when we get around to my quarantine tank. If you'll remember, I said I pulled all those neons out of my quarantine tank. The reason I did that was because I bought some more fish the other day and I had to put them in my quarantine tank. So we'll get to that when we get to the quarantine tank. Um, so that is the only change additional that I'm going to make to this tank. I've got a few fish that I'm going to add uh, in here and then other than that we are pretty much done. I'm really happy with the way it looks. I'm really happy with the way the Black Ghost Knife Fish is moving around and everything seems to be pretty cool. So this is a pretty much done tank for now and then I suppose over time as the Black Ghost Knife Fish gets bigger he's going to probably have to be rehomed. I didn't realize they got 20 inches um, when I bought it. I thought they got about 10 or 12 and that was about the max but no biggie that's going to be a while down the road and i've always got options for that later so i'm not sweating about that we can enjoy it while we can my 20 long open top this tank is about to be broken down um I'm not going to have this tank very much longer. I have deliberately not done anything with it this week because I do want to talk about some stuff that's going on in this tank. One of the things that's going on is you can see how little surface agitation I have. I mean, it's pretty much stagnant at this end. And that is because the water level is a little bit down and the inflow is actually flowing down into the tank rather than across the surface. If I fill it up to where that filter... Uh, intake is actually level with the surface. I'll get much more surface agitation. The water moves down the length of the tank and then we get a lot more uh, circulation down at this end. I'm not too worried about it at the moment because I am getting ready to do some work in here. I'm going to shoot some video on that as well. And I have deliberately been leaving this um, arrowhead plant alone. If you see all of that green scum all over it, that is green cyanobacteria or sometimes it's called blue green algae i want to talk at length about that when i do the video because i've wrestled with that stuff in this tank for a long time i have my suspicions as to why it's coming back and why it's coming back in such force but i deliberately left it in there and have been leaving it in there it's not hurting anything it just looks ugly as hell and if you let it get too out of control you can start throwing your uh, oxygen and co2 levels out of balance uh, I'm not anywhere near that just yet. I'm just at a, you know, slightly unattractive looking tank because it's got a bunch of green slime cyanobacteria growing in it. So that's going to get taken out. I am actually just going to pull that whole entire piece of arrowhead out and throw it away and just put a new piece in rather than trying to clean all that algae off of there and everything. But I wanted everybody to have a really good look at what that stuff looks like. Because if you see this stuff in your tank and if you've been fighting algae and you're curious as to what kind of algae in your tank has that strange look, it is not algae, it is cyanobacteria and you need to treat it completely different. Uh, Ultralife makes a product for the blue-green slime. Uh, it works very effectively if you follow the instructions. Take using the airstone part of the instructions very seriously. You will kill fish if you do not have vigorous surface agitation and uh, a good amount of air moving through an airstone. Lots of circulation, lots of aeration, and if you use the product as directed, uh, you should be able to get rid of your um, 
cyanobacteria problems. My problem, I believe, is stemming from this light. And I know I haven't done a video about aquarium lighting in a while, so that's kind of why I'm letting this one ride. And when I do the video where I do the water change and clean that out, I'm going to talk about lighting and I'm going to talk about why I think the lighting uh, is impacting the cyanobacteria growth in there. There actually is a correlation and I can explain it. It'll make more sense later. So stay tuned for that. That'll be a video coming up. That'll actually probably be a couple videos coming up. I'll do one on the lighting and I'll do one on just the you know the water change and the um you know the before and after sort of thing that i usually do but i do want to talk about lighting i do want to talk about how lighting affects cyanobacteria growth because it does not grow and photosynthesize the same way your regular plants in your tank do so there is a correlation there but we'll get to that uh, when we get to it my brackish tank is another one that is going to be coming down very soon um it's going to be changed into a different tank. What I'm going to do is I'm going to set butter bean up in a 20 standard. And of course the uh, bumblebee gobies that are in there with him are going to go into the new tank as well. Um, I'm going to put it at the end, uh, the far end of my 125. When you first walk into the uh, fish room area to the left, there's just enough space for me to squeeze one more tank in right there. And that's where Butterbean's tank is going to go. The reason I'm doing that is because of the red slime cyanobacteria that is in this tank. I've given up. I cannot get it out. I've done treatment after treatment. Um, I've cleaned. I've scrubbed. I've reduced his feeding. I purchased uh, through a donation from a viewer. I was able to purchase uh, a much higher quality LED than I had than I used to have on there. Um, once again, the lighting being very significant in cyanobacteria growth. I thought the higher quality LED would help sort the problems out but it did not and it actually looks pretty good right now I know it looks like you see a lot of red nastiness in there but I did a big water change a couple days ago and I actually used a siphon and sucked all of the cyanobacteria off of the rocks those rocks were not only covered in red but they were like it was like a sheet it had bubbles and everything underneath it if you've seen any of my other videos where you've seen it in there really bad um, that's what it had gotten to again it does that in a matter of a week or two now I have just a coat of red slime over everything in that tank and I'm just done I've, I've just had it up to here and I know you can't see where I'm putting my hand at my damn eyebrows but I've had it up to there um, with the cyanobacteria in this tank so I'm, I'm going to just set up a new tank altogether um, I'm not putting anything from this tank into that tank um, not sure what I'm going to do about the filtration yet because obviously I need to move the filters uh, to the other tank what I may do is I want to continue using this UV uh, sterilizing hang on the back filter it's a really good one but I've got another one just like it on this tank and I can actually use this one when I break this tank down, I can break this one down first, sterilize that filter, clean it out, dry it off, get it ready to go, and then I can set up another tank for Butterbean, and I can just let it do its thing. I can let it cycle naturally, and I can get that all well established and everything using this filter. And then when I'm ready, I can simply remove the animals from this tank, put them in a tank that's already new and established for them, and then I can begin the process of breaking all this down and sterilizing all this and cleaning it all up, uh, which will give me another um, UV sterilizing filter to do whatever I need to do with. Um, there is a reason these two tanks are coming down. Uh, if you'll notice the uh, room, I've got sort of the flat wall comes down, and then I create sort of this curved effect that comes around. And then I have this as sort of my bottom end of the fish room as I think about it, or the far wall, if you will. Uh, back there is where I have my exercycle and some various exercise equipment or whatever. So this is kind of like the end of the room, and it sort of separates the two. What I intend on doing is actually taking this shelf that you can see the 20 long is sitting on. It is just as wide as a 20 long. So what I'm going to do is actually widen that out a little bit. And that will allow me to put another tank on there. And I think what I'm going to do is get a 55. And I'm going to put a 55 on this side of the 40. So it'll be 55, 55. I'll have the 40 at an angle. I'll have another 55. And then we'll jump across to this side of the room and we'll go to my other 40. 
and then of course we've got my big 125 down here so i think it'll look a lot nicer rather than having these smaller tanks all scattered around like this it'll create much more of a finished sort of effect it'll give me one big tank and you are going to love what i'm going to do with the tank there's no question about it there's no thought there's no uh, discussion i already know full well what it's going to be and i'm keeping that a secret but you're going to love it trust me um this is a tank that i will have to move somewhere else because this tank is my quarantine tank and if you will look very closely in there you will see that i have five little tiger barbs so the tiger barbs are what are going to go back into my black ghost knife fish tank and i have three in there now i used to have five and over the last couple of months two of them have gone and i'm down to three tiger barbs and that's not really enough to make it a, a viable school i want them you know i want that schooling behavior and you don't really get that when you've only got three you've got to get up to a certain um density concentration and then suddenly a school uh, or a shoal will coalesce out of a group of fish so i'm hoping by putting five more barbs in there uh, once they've grown out a little bit i'm going to give them maybe a month in this uh tank maybe six weeks in this tank and then i'll move them over into the um i keep wanting to call this my t-bar tank i'll move them over here into the now black ghost knife fish tank and these already larger barbs that you can see here will have five more smaller companions in there uh, and hopefully that will make for a nice um well-rounded school of eight barbs so that's what's going on on this end of the room we jump across to this side and i've got my snail tank which is just a snail tank that's not doing anything uh, i do find it interesting however that since i use these tongs to pull the snails out and put them in butter beans tank i've actually now got cyanobacteria growing in this tank it's the green stuff but i'm sure it's been cross-contaminated um, with these tongs, you know, pulling in and out of that other tank. I'm really actually kind of surprised I don't have the red slime cyanobacteria growing in here. And I really, really believe it has something to do with the brackish water. I think it's got something to do with the specific gravity in this water because I don't have issues with this red slime anywhere else in the room. And I'm not super super crazy about sterilizing everything between tanks and you know if this was a surgery everybody would be cross-contaminated by now believe me um, I do not use sterile non cross-contaminating techniques uh, on these tanks and yet this is still the only tank I have issues with this red slime in and I cannot get on top of it um, so I do believe that the brackish water has something to do with that anyway moving on we're already done with the brackish tank I just got kind of sidelined and distracted um, this is my new, I don't know if I want to call it my favorite tank, but I kind of want to call it my new favorite tank. It is formerly my gudgeon tank. I'm right now, I'm calling it my gudgeon slash t-bar tank because I moved my t-bar over into this tank and I could not be happier with the results I'm seeing. I'm not getting any aggression between the t-bar and the gudgeon, or I should say no more than I would expect. You know, a t-bar is a cichlid and cichlids are dicks and you know, he's just gonna be snappy and aggressive and he kind of chases the other fish around a little from time to time. But that's what you expect when you have any kind of cichlid in any kind of tank. You know, they're, they're cichlids, they're just sort of aggressive little fish. Um, but you can see they're right side by side right there and there's no real aggression. There's no aggression towards the rainbow fish. The gudgeon was very curious about them at first. He thought maybe they might be a snack. Um, pretty much figured out that they're not and has left them alone ever since. And now they all, you know, when I come over to the glass, you can see they all come up and they're waiting because they know it's breakfast time and they know I'm the one that feeds them. They're not actually going after each other as a food source in the tank anymore. Um, so you can see the gudgeon just swimming right past those rainbows with no concern at all. So I'm very, very happy with the way this tank turned out. And again, I really have to thank the viewer that suggested putting uh, the T-bar in this tank because I had dismissed that out of hand uh, until someone else suggested it. And then I put a little more thought into it and uh, began asking some other people that had some experience with this gudgeon. And uh, I did get the go-ahead that it was probably a safe bet to do this. I spoke with multiple people, and they all said the same thing, that they really did not think that there would be an issue between the T-bar and the gudgeon. The only thing I was warned about was I wanted to put some more bottom-dwelling fish in here. I was considering maybe like a peacock eel. Um, 
or something to that effect, you know, some sort of bottom dwelling fish. And while the T-bar and the gudgeon cannot be thought of as bottom dwelling fish, as evidenced by their behavior right now, they don't necessarily hang out around the bottom like a quarry or a, you know, a Pictus catfish might, but they're cave dwellers and they're both sort of diggers. And in that respect, you kind of have to think about them as being bottom type fish. And if I've got bottom dwellers that are real true bottom dwellers like eels and quarries, um, we could start running into issues. So because of that, I opted to go with more middle swimming type fish. I did put five of these rainbow fish in there. They are called Marcy rainbow fish. Um, I don't know a lot about them, but I think they are actually a man-made hybrid that is very, very closely related to the Parkinson's or Parkinsoni uh, rainbow fish. So, not really sure what's going on, but the fish store I got them from has uh, quite a few more in the tank. I've already spoken with the owner of the store. The one fish I did lose, um, he's going to compensate me for, and we're going to do an even exchange. I did keep the fish. He's frozen in the other room in my freezer, and probably Monday or Tuesday, I'm going to head back down to the fish store and get one or maybe even two more of these rainbow fish i really like them and i really would like to see that school get a little tighter and uh, coalesce a little more and i think i can do that by bolstering the numbers of the rainbow fish in there uh they're not inexpensive fish they 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 were pricey little fish there so i don't know how many i'm going to be able to really put in there um and of course i don't want too many i don't want to fill it up with rainbow fish they're only um young at the moment they're going to get much much larger than this they're probably going to get to be about i'm guessing about the size of my three spot garamis you know maybe about four to five inches in length when they're full grown um they're not really fast growers so i'm not you know going to run out of room anytime in the near future um, but i still don't want to you know i still do need to think about long term and i don't want to completely overfill the tank with fish i want this to be a more balanced tank and have a little bit less of that high stocking density that most of my tanks typically have um, but i am going to bolster the school of rainbows a little bit and i am considering considering a very surfacey type surface fish um the idea of the killifish uh, has crossed my mind. I've even had a few people recommend killifish. I've always sort of wanted one, um, but I've never really had the opportunity or the tank. Um, but I actually don't think I'm going to do the killifish. I've actually got another fish in mind that would be sort of an oddball that wouldn't really go with any theme that I've got going on in this tank. And honestly, I don't really have a theme going on in this tank. Uh, the rainbow fish are not Australian. The gudgeon is Australian. The T-bar is from Central America. Um, so there's no, there's no theme in this tank at all. I can't call it my sort of Central American tank or my sort of Australian tank. Um, so putting the fish in there that I want to put in there, and I will give you a little hint, it is a very surfacey fish and it is an African fish. So if that goes in there, I'll have fish pretty much from all around the damn world in here. All I'll need to do is put some like Indonesian barbs in there, something like that, maybe a, uh, red, red tail, uh, sword or a shark rather. Um, don't know why I said sword. Red tail shark would be a nice Indonesian fish I could put in there. And then I could have this as my global tank. But whatever it is and whatever it's going to turn out to be, I really, really like it. I'm really happy with it and I hope you are too. I've spent a lot of time and effort, um, mental effort mostly, just pondering this tank for so long before it finally came together and finally came into something uh, I wanted. And as usual with most of my tanks, it just sort of happened. I never really went into this tank with any real plan. Um, I vaguely sort of wanted to do something Australian-y. And I happened upon these gudgeons. I found out they were from Australia. So I said, that's cool. Let's go with the Australian theme. And then one thing led to another. And it never really developed into an Australian theme. Um, but if you have been patient with me and you have waited while I've sorted this all out... Uh, it has definitely paid off because this really, really has turned into a nice tank. And as it grows and matures and as the tank grows in, as the fish grow in, uh, I think this is really, really going to be a crackerjack tank. So moving on, not quite last and certainly not least is my 125. Uh, also have nothing at all going on in this tank. I did want to point out, however, that I did a water change on this tank not long ago, and when I checked the pH, the pH between my tap water and my tank water were similar enough uh, that it did allow me to do a very, very thorough big water change, and I did about a 50% water change. And since then, if we come down here, you see all this brown on the glass? 
that's that diatom algae again. So if you've been following along with my videos and you remember me talking about the diatom algae that was developing in my gudgeon tank that we were just looking at, one of the things I concluded was doing massive water changes was adding silicates to the tank uh, that I did test for. I do know that I have silicates in my water and excuse me, I do have enough silicates in my water that that would be good for diatom algae growth. And what happens is as time goes on, the diatoms will use up the silicates you've got in the water and they basically stop their own growth. They keep themselves in check by using up the very low amounts of silicates that are available to them. So doing 10% water changes is fine because you're not putting enough silicates back in the tank that actually allow them to start growing again. When I do these massive water changes, especially in a 125, you know, I'm swapping out 50, 60 gallons of water. Um, I'm putting a lot of silicates back in the tank and within a week of doing so, I've got brown diatom growth all over the front glass again. So that cinches it for me. There's no doubt uh, in my mind whatsoever that out of the many things that you can knock out of balance and throw out of whack in your tank by doing huge water changes, uh, one of those things is the silicate levels and if you're having issues with uh, brown algae, diatom algae, one of the things you might want to consider is how large of water changes are you doing? Are you using a lot of fresh water when you do your water changes? If you are, you very likely could be putting a lot of silicates back in your tank with every water change and just continuing to make the problem worse. Um, my Congos here almost look like a bait ball. They're getting in there and they're so densely uh, packed together with breeding. This is what I was hoping for. I have seven males and five females and the younger males are now starting to get big enough that they can compete with the larger males. And now instead of having two or three larger males competing and then several smaller males competing, I'm actually starting to get everybody competing with everybody. And the displays you'll get if you get Congo Tetras will just blow you away. I always recommend Congo Tetras. They're a fairly large fish. Um, they need a lot of running around room. I wouldn't really want to put them in anything. I guess maybe if you had a small school of like five, you could get away with a 40 breeder um, or a 40 long. If you've got that four foot length or if you've got that 18 inch depth, uh, that will provide these fish with a lot of room to dart and dash and run around. Um, then I think you'll be okay with a school of them. I would recommend a 55 or larger, and then I would recommend at least a school of five to six or larger of these Congos, but they are just super fish. They're docile in the sense that they're not, you know, they're like Tetras. It's like basically having a, a school of skirt Tetras in your tank, except they're not skirt Tetras. Look at them. You know, they look like that, but they behave as aggressively as skirt Tetras do. So they're great community fish. Um, the, the, the fins on the males, the coloration, the, the streamers, just everything about them is absolutely fantastic. And they spawn all the time. I've never gotten any babies. Um, they're egg scatterers. They're not, you know, they just sort of flick around and eggs go everywhere. Uh, and then they immediately turn around and start eating their own eggs and the loaches go crazy and everybody feasts when they're in there spawning. Um, but judging by how vigorous the display behavior is now, I wouldn't be surprised if within an hour or two I'm actually seeing some eggs being um, put out in the tank. So I may not even feed this tank this morning. Uh, I may let the Congos do that for me. So that's really all that's going on in here. Again, just a look at the tank, a little discussion about the diatoms, but nothing's really happening in there. Now I can say last, my crayfish tank. Um, not a lot going on here as far as the tank itself. I am getting a little bit of new growth coming in. Uh, if you can see this dead looking piece of fern there, that is dead because I did this with the light. I just angled it like that and just putting more direct light on that fern was just too much for it and I actually wound up killing this original piece that came in with it from out in the yard. And then of course I've got all these new shoots that are coming in and growing in and they're looking good. Uh, the hosta is the same way. You can kind of see some of these shoots down here on the bottom of the hosta have died off. They were the original ones that came in, but I've got some nice new green growth coming up in the back. Uh, my other plants are doing fine. You can tell that the creeping jenny is sort of cut off right there at the water level because the crayfish get in there and eat them. Speaking of one, there's one hiding in the corner. He has no claws left at all anymore, uh, and he's actually missing a few legs. So even though he was the big one in the tank, uh, he also lost out. He, he shed or he sloughed his shell and as he was a soft shell 
he was vulnerable. So big or not, he got munched on and got a bunch of legs removed and got both of his claws removed. The dominant one also lost a claw. I'm not sure to who, but uh, my dominant crayfish now only has one claw. And of course, they're not out or active at the moment because I just turned the light on and everybody's all going to ground and hiding. Uh, you can actually see a little bit of that diatom growth in here because this tank is new and settling in. But the point I wanted to make is that it is settled in. I finally got it um, cycled so I don't have to do any water changes or disturb it for the most part now. And as a result, you can see all the construction that's been going on. Everybody's dug in. Everybody's made their own little homes and caves. And you can see it's not just, you know, they scoop some rocks out. They really build. They really dig cave systems and homes. And everybody's staked out their little territories. So now it should get interesting watching everybody grow and develop and stake out those territories and defend them. Um, so as time goes on, I will try to get more video of this tank as well. But like I said, it's just been a busy week. I've had a lot of stuff going on that really needed to get taken care of. Um, so playing with crayfish has not been on the top of my agenda. Um, I also think I'm going to go down to the stream maybe today or tomorrow and see if I can't catch a couple little uh, native little minnows or maybe some little tiny sculpins or something just to put a little more activity in the tank they probably won't last long the crayfish will catch them and eat them but you know that's all part of having a native tank is you know it's a predatory environment and you're going to see that kind of stuff um so i might shoot a little bit of video soon of me at the stream catching some fish maybe i'll do some video of me releasing the fish into this tank uh, like I said, I just got a lot on my plate as far as videos I want to shoot. And finally, I will add that it is also summertime, uh, and I've just discovered the joys of kayaking, and I've just been out and about. I'm trying to get on top of my uh, business with my work. This is my busy time of year. So I've also had limited time to shoot video. Um, so if you still are with me come November and December when the weather gets a little cold and nasty, uh, then the videos will crank up and you will start to see me really put a lot of content out uh, because I'll basically be spending my winter down here in the fish room and I get bored and I shoot videos. I'm also toying with the idea of going live and doing live streaming. I know a lot of people uh, have asked me to do that. Uh, that is something I'm considering. So that's possible that over the winter um, you may see some live streams come where you can just hang out with me here in the fish room. And instead of doing these tours like this on video, we can just walk around and have a chat uh, in the fish room uh, live while I'm doing it. So that's an option. That's something I'm considering. You know, you're welcome to give me your two cents on that, how you feel about the idea of something like that. And finally, I will say we have come completely around the world. We are back to where we started at my 29 miscellaneous. So thanks for sticking with me on this one. I know it was a lot to cover. You might have to watch it twice to get all that. And I'm sure I probably missed some details along the way. Like I said, it's been a busy week. And I really am just trying to get this out of the way today so I can get started uh, on doing some of the stuff that I've already been talking about. So thanks for watching this one. And if you're not already subscribed, please go ahead and do so. That way you don't miss any of the stuff I'm talking about. And I got a lot of other good stuff coming up too. Um, I am still planning on doing some underwater photography with my uh, boat once I get my boat out on the water so we might be getting to see some really live action fish um, some bass some sunfish things like that out at the reservoir um, from the fish's point of view underwater so look forward to that as well once I get my boat out and on the water so thanks again for watching please subscribe please like please share and I'll see you real soon on the next one thanks again